Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode four of People Don't Like Us podcast. Introducing me, the host, Aaron Bilbo, and my guest, Matt Burke. He is the host of Magic Minds podcast and recent author of My Head to My Heart. Uh, Matt, thank you for joining me, and it's definitely great to have you um, all the way from Ireland, and we're doing this at one in the morning for me and six in the morning for you to stretch it for the audience and make it happen. So uh, yeah, let's uh, dig into it. I want to start with some of your personal story, just kind of what brought you to where your head's at today, you know, and then kind of what led you to write a book. Uh, yeah, Aaron, first and foremost, Thanks very much for inviting me onto your show. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, it's a brilliant way to connect with people. Social media, you know, social media just get a bad time sometimes. You know, you know, it's all negativity. But I truly believe what's looking for you will find you. And if you're looking for positive uh, and inspiring people, that's what you'll find. You get what you look for. So it's brilliant to connect with somebody in America. Although yeah, it's six absolutely. Months. Although it's six o'clock here, uh, I just love this and it's brilliant. I love these connections and it's great that we can inspire people and it's great just speaking to you just off camera there a minute ago. Seems like that's where you're going with your life as well. So it's lovely that we've uh, we've uh, same thoughts and same purpose in life. So I suppose my my backstory is, you know, the book is my head to my heart. It's all about how I move from my head to my heart. So how did I? Uh, begin to live in that house or mansion or castle in my mind childhood trauma you know I've had a childhood trauma from very young age I was uh, experienced sexual abuse uh, violence in my mind violence in my life you know what is violence what is sex abuse you know people let's right. not get caught on the details of that but they were they were difficult experience for a child for, for a five six seven eight year old nine year old ten year old you know, uh, it was Absolutely. chaos. I was soft. I was vulnerable. I was a sensitive, sensitive soul. So when I heard all this, seen all this, the happening that was experienced to me, they made me close up. I just, I, I shut away from the world. I went into my mind. I, I Anything I done, I did to protect myself, keep myself from danger, unbeknownst to myself. I didn't know I was doing that. It's only in, in the latter years from maybe 12 years ago, or since 2012, that I started doing the work that I realized, you know, I, from an early age, from 11, I started drinking, you know, taking drugs, um, you know, toxic behavior, you know, just trying to protect myself, trying to anesthetize myself um, from perceived dangers, the dangers happening to me again, you know, I, you know, I, I just went into myself, you know, and although it, it wasn't obvious to people, I was a very, you know, vibrant, excited, crazy little kid. But that was just, I was I was a ginger kid. So people maybe just thought I was just a wild child. But, right. you know, really, really, I was being wild. And because I was a hurt soul, but I didn't know it at the time. And just sure, look, I'm only a statistic. There's, there's millions and millions of people out there like me that are branded just bad children or bold children are just troublesome. And really there was the stuff that went on that people just didn't know about and I never told them for a Absolutely. long long time yeah I, I can't tell you honestly from my perspective how much that resonates with me because from my early childhood as well uh from about five I suffered and witnessed some pretty extreme abuse and uh we moved beyond that but various different types of abuse I witnessed through my life from there and then just getting picked on in school and stuff I, you know like you said you just kind of reserve into yourself and you you question the world differently I think um especially when you've been bullied and you know suffered trauma as a kid you you develop your own tools for uh coping with the world and you know for me video games was a really big impact on my life just uh e even still today i mean i play video games a lot but i've been getting into this kind of dad mode and uh 
bettering myself mode. So I'm kind of at this stage where I'm slowly finding myself bored with the game and feel like I need to be working on my podcast or, you know, working on something. And I, I, it's always been in my head, something, what is that something, you know, floating from job to job. I've had God over a, a hundred jobs in 16 years in the workforce. I mean, and I know, understand that that's not uncommon, but I think the a big reason for that is because we're not really taught to seek our passion and figure out what our passion is from an early age. You know, I mean, people say like, what do you want to be? But, or things like, you know, you can be anything you want, but unless you have someone that reaches into your life and, and really guides you on the path to that, that dream, you're left to fend for yourself, you know, and you, you, so you, you just got to find that path for yourself. So again, you know, I've just, I found myself asking all those same questions of myself, just how, how can I be a better me? How can I keep stress out of my life, but still move forward? And, um, anyways, uh, so yeah, all of that just entirely resonates with me, just your, your early life there. And, um, what is it that, uh, brought you up to the book like in your recent life what what made you finally go you know what I'm going to write a book and it's going to be about this topic you know I feel like I know enough about this like what what brought you to that point well here's the here's the strange here's the strange things Aaron I, I didn't plan to write this uh it wasn't a, like anything I, I did in my life uh, for you it just happened uh if you want to say coincidence, you want to call it God or direction. I, 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 I didn't. I didn't plan it. So really, the road to Damascus, I suppose, was two thousand and eight when I went back to to education. I went, you know, with failings all my life, uh, failings in relationship, failings in school, failings in driving, failings, 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 and I was unemployed and I had no leaving cert, no education. I went back to college because the the in, in Ireland, we went through a recession in 2007. So I was working as a doorman, I was on the labor and, you know, the, the, the social welfare, you know, wanted me to get a job and they sent me on some courses. So I, I went to a, a local employment center and this guy, he says me, oh, there's a course in fitness instructor. And I was like, oh, you know, I, I have no education, blah, blah. So anyway, I went and did that. And then, you know, that was the start of me changing my life. Before that, I was heavily into drugs, steroids, uh, all sorts of dodgy dealings, all sorts of toxic behavior. And you right. know, from that day, I just said, you know what, I'm going to change and I'm going to give away all, I'm going to get rid of all my, my dodginess, my phones, my all sorts of stuff. And uh, and that started me off. And then I just, you know, I done a, a personal training uh qualification a, a leisure management degree or a leisure management course and then i went on and done a sports science degree and i got a job in national rehab and you know it just all started uh, i started falling in love with education i've done tons and tons of courses level eight in leadership and then i started the magic minds podcast and you know i never started out with the you know to inspire people or find love and kindness it found me my purpose found right. me but just by doing the things that I love to do. You know, in 2015, I started writing like poetry, you know, just to express my my feelings. And because there was stuff in here I couldn't I couldn't get out, although I was doing counseling. And and that's what the book is about. It's about from my head to my heart, because everything was up here, but I, I felt nothing here. I I, I I intellectually talked about feelings and emotions. And so we just slowly started writing them down. And like the book is a collection of my poetry and it starts off with my backstory and how I use gratitude and love, kindness, compassion, understanding, forgiveness. But it was just, it's not like I sat down or I went off to a log cabin in the forest and, and wrote like you hear about these authors. It was right. nearly like a, I was, all my poems are scattered everywhere and I pulled them all together and I really put it, I brought it all together. How did I move from this piece here down into my heart? And it was like right, true compassion, it was true love, it was true poetry, it was true gratitude, it was true all these things I've been practicing since 2000 and 
say eight or ten or twelve when I started counselling I just brought it all together and I was like how did I move from here to here and it was it was a bit of everything and you know uh, you know I I I, I I attempted or I contemplated taking my own life by suicide and I talk about that at the start and like how right. did I go from that point and what were all the things that got me there like I basically and I was telling somebody the other day I've rewired my what I know about science you know working in a uh, brain injury rehab and interviewing so many people in my own self-directed learning I basically changed my internal biochemistry. You know, I went around totally worried, like, you know, a snow globe, you shake a snow globe, right. full of cortisol, always stressed, always worried, but people didn't know. It was like a duck. My legs were paddling, but up here I looked calm. So inside, cortisol, worry, stress. Now, by the thoughts that I choose, it's now oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, true love, kindness, compassion, gratitude. That's how I see the world now. I changed how I look. So my internal world is different. So I see the world totally different because I choose the thoughts that serve me well. And that's love, kindness, gratitude, compassion, understanding, forgiveness. And that's taken a lot of work, a lot, a lot of work. You know, you have to do the work. People think compassion and forgiveness is, is white and fluffy, but it's not, Aaron. Because right. it takes you doing the work. You have to first practice forgiveness for yourself. You have to practice patience, understanding, love, kindness for you. When you do that for yourself, you are a kinder, better human being right. to the rest of the world. When you're soft and gentle with yourself, you're soft and gentle. And you'll see that yourself, Aaron. If you're in a pissed off mood today, or like I, I have this tool I use, I, I rate myself between one and 10, and you can't say five, 10 being Gucci, one being I should have stayed in bed. If you're a two or a one, or if your family members tell you that, you'd be a little kinder with them, wouldn't you? You know, so you know exactly where you are. So if you can be a little bit kinder and gentler, aware of how you are, mind, body, and soul, you're just a little bit easier on the world. When you're easier on yourself, you just be a little bit more gentle with other people. Yeah, I've actually, uh, I've noticed this semi-recently as well, that um, in being married i i happened to watch a tiktok video the other day of this guy that was talking about uh just being a better husband to your wife and doing things around the house and you know if you're not doing those things you're not really a man you're still a boy you know if you think that you don't have any ownership or responsibility to doing dishes or doing laundry or helping make the bed those kind of things you know it, it just made me think like for all the time that you spend fighting your hatred of dishes or laundry or whatever the thing may be that's irksome to you, if you just embraced doing it instead of trying to fight it, you would expend the energy better than, <laughs> than <clears throat> the anger and the, the stress that you allow yourself over things that are super menial or or seem tedious or monotonous right yeah it, it does there's, there's a there's a psychological theory isn't there uh, play, uh, i'm not sure who it was from it's they talk about transaction analysis you know uh in, in any kind of transaction whether it's with your wife or your friend or your parent we we we, we can be either an adult a child uh what was your room was it was adult child and parent so you and i are two adults here speaking but maybe when i'm with my partner or my you know i could be triggered and we go back to this place of childhood so when people you know have difficulties around chores in the house or dishes they might be triggered by that event because a parent once spoke to them or they probably feel you know a sense of inequality or an injustice and they will act out of that child place so they might be resistant to the, the, the chores because it reminds them of a parent telling them what to do like when we're driving and somebody cuts across us sometimes we will go into parent because we've seen a parent act like this when somebody cuts us off like ah, blah 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 right you know so me and you are just two adults here sitting speaking but then if you start becoming authoritarian maybe or become aggressive i may feel like a child again so the, the transaction analysis to say we can we can we can bounce between either adult child or parent depending on the the transaction so 
when we're, when you're with your wife and she starts giving you grief about not cleaning the house or doing the dishes, you may kind of revert into that child mode. <laughs> yeah, so you will defend, and then she will go into parent your child. She's parent, right? But then if you become cognizant and aware, ah, I feel like because I talk about minding your little self all the time, and people are like, what is this? Because recently someone told me that's a bit condescending, mind your little self. But what I I can't go around saying to people, all right, kind of I want, but you got to mind your inner child, da da da. People are telling me to fuck off, you know, and they're like, well, yeah, fuck off. And I, so it's a bit of social intelligence. I just say, you know, if you feel scared or you feel vulnerable, there's a little, there's a sense of smallerness in you. So if you can become aware in an argument or a moment with your partner or family member, aha, I feel a little bit triggered here. It's not them, it's me. They're triggering something in me. What right. can I learn about this? Right. And it, everything for me, Aaron, is around awareness like you know how often i spend all my life looking out at the world trying to change everything now i try to change myself because when when i change how i view the world the world changes for me and by right. becoming aware or cognizant when i'm triggered like in conversations I'm like ah oh, look i feel triggered i feel judged i feel whatever 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 i can just then try can i be with that you know yeah. so how does that resonate with you um it's man there's so many things that you said there that i wanted to touch on and i kind of like lost my train of thought not wanting to cut you off <laughs> um <laughs> it's okay it really i try to live in kind of the now and you know for me that's always kind of been the case. I've had ups and downs in my life where I've I've lived without material worries and things like that, but then I've lived pretty much as poor as can be and eaten nothing but peanut butter for a couple of weeks and, you know, couldn't afford even ramen noodles and just, it's been bad too, you know? So I I got into this mode of never looking forward to the future but also because of all the kind of abuse that I suffered, I try not to dwell on the past, right? So I've just always lived in the moment. And uh, procrastination has been a great tool for me <laughs> to uh, to balance stress and anxiety because I don't worry about it until it's time to worry about it, right? until the very moment that it's time to worry about it, <laughs> whether that's an hour before or five minutes before, or, you know, it, but it, it can be a helpful tool too. I actually watched a Ted talk on this not long ago, but um, like procrastination also supplies you room for creativity because you're, you're still weighing out the situation before you actually arrive at the situation even though you're not letting it sit at the forefront of your mind right mm -hmm. you still have an opportunity to kind of tango with it all the way up to the moment and then that moment offers you that that best opportunity for your your creativity to flow um so with that too you know i really try to operate my entire life kind of in a stress-free zone and uh but you're right there there are triggers that come into play and i'm not always perfect at recognizing them right i think all of us kind of struggle with that but as i get older and as i've become a husband and become a father uh it it's made me introspect on those things and um kind of see where they are and you know my wife and i we have a lot of conversations about communication and just how we can both be better at it um you know it but it all of those things that you were describing like they, they play a constant factor in our lives how we judge every situation you know um and i think fortunately for myself and for yourself you know we've arrived at places where we kind of feel the same way you know we just want to give kind of compassion to the people around us we hope and expect to receive that compassion in return 
uh, the thing I think I struggle with most now is that it just doesn't seem to be that simple in the world. You know, there, there really are purely evil forces that are out there, like trying to tear us down, trying to, you know, that they don't want to see people like us who are open-minded and interested in spreading this message of just compassion and, you know, logical thinking, critical thinking. Um, but, you know, I think though that us picking up this mantle, you writing your book, for instance, or, or being willing to put yourself out there like that, um, I think these things are going to fuel the next generation, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I, and I'm, I, that kind of brings me to my next question for you, which is like, what's your biggest hope for the book? You know, you decided to put yourself out there and you know completely vulnerable right like these are these are your personal thoughts as you said this isn't just like i decided i'm gonna sit and research and write a book this is some compiled thoughts i'm sure there's research involved right but the mostly compiled thoughts from just you and and your raw self so you know what it, what are you hoping to achieve with your book um uh, yeah that's a great question um one of my hopes, everything now, Aaron, you know, again, it found me, my purpose and my, my, my goal in life. I hope to inspire uh, people to to heal themselves through love, kindness, compassion, understanding, forgiveness, through my story, through my vulnerabilities. You know, my honest, I'm just a statistic. I'm one of billions of childhood trauma people. Right. You know, they have experience like, you know, so childhood, childhood trauma is not just sexual abuse. There's, there's many things, you know, where it's 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 relatable to the person, it's person, their experience and how they uh, live life. So they can, you know, somebody screaming at them as a young child may cause them trauma or sexual abuse or, you know, a, or a physical voice, whatever it is. It doesn't really matter. A childhood trauma is childhood trauma. So I want to be that uh, that voice that, you know, as a male to come and talk about my vulnerability, to come and talk about my past, to be honest, be open, you know. I, I talk about all aspects of my life, whether it's through su success through the podcast or, or uh, you know, the, the difficulties I may have, uh, difficulties around public speaking, you know, I get really nervous before things and I'll just be honest and open and tell them. But my greatest thing is that I want to go on and achieve and I want to be successful. What's success for me? And, you know, it can be anything you want. It can be, you can be whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. And I want to be that uh, inspiration for people to see that, you know, I've had a difficult past, like many people, you know, but you can still, you, I use my, my, my poison, my past as my potion. You know, right. I, I now talk about it. I, 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 I embrace my vulnerabilities. I embrace that. I get nervous. I embrace, and I just honestly talk about them because I never experienced it. I never had a language for that. I didn't know about anxiety, fear, worry. I just thought I was a warrior, and I, I, I drank and took drugs to, 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 to pacify it and anesthetize it. Now I recognize it, and I speak because the videos I make or the book that I wrote, I want this to be just part of people's awareness that this can happen. This can happen to you. This can happen to anybody. It's not. Uh, just for working class people, middle class people, black, white, male, female, non-binary, transsexual, it, it doesn't matter. You know, right. same feelings, same emotions, but different stories. We all have different stories, but we experience the same. Just like the COVID, Aaron, you know, this COVID situation, this is like, the COVID is like the, the character out of Scooby-Doo. It's just fear dressed up as something else. Tomorrow will be cancer. Tomorrow, people will be worried about something all their life. Today it's COVID. Tomorrow will be a parent dying of cancer or their kids getting sick or something, 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 something. We will face worry, anxiety, dread in an, in an, dressed up as something else. And that's what I've had to deal with all my life. So when COVID came along, I was like, I've had many, many COVIDs all my life. You know, I've worried about, you know, dying. I worry about taking my own life, you know. So when this came about, I was like, wow, I've seen all this before. But the one thing COVID has shown is how alike we all are, how scared the world is. Doesn't matter whether you have money in the bank, doesn't matter you have a big house or you don't have a house. People are worried about dying. They're worried about parents dying. They're worried about cousins. They're worried about getting sick themselves. 
Yeah. It just shows how alike we all are and how uh, vulnerable we all can be, whether you are uh, rich or poor or from a... From I a- said when the, immediately when the pandemic was kind of announced and my wife and I were sitting here freaking out about all of it, uh, I said the exact same thing. I said, you know, this is this is one of those true balancing mechanisms. Like you if you've got all these millions of dollars and you think that you're in this perfect bubble protected from the the vulner, vulnerabilities of the general populace right you don't you don't want for anything ever something like this comes along and levels the playing field mm-hmm. right immediately we're all worried about the same thing it doesn't matter how much money you have yeah you may be able to get better health care but you don't really know if all your money in the best healthcare is going to make a difference, you know, this was right at the start of the pandemic. Obviously yeah. there, there are certain things now that can be done and hopefully would, you know, stabilize most people. Um, but of course you never really know. So it, it does, it levels the playing field for all of us and, you know, not necessarily in a good way. Nobody wants to really be dealing with this, but mm, yeah, it just it. touches to your point. But, uh, also to your point about kind of what really brought you to sharing your experience for me like for you it was your journey of just your life but then you arrived at that job that opportunity to go work as a trainer and uh that kind of led you into the rest of kind of your philosophy now for me it was always music and um stand up comedy um music i I like i like all kinds of music and this is going to be a big part of the podcast at a certain point i'm i'm planning a music episode pretty soon but ultimately i I've always looked for music that inspires me, that really speaks to me. I think we kind of all do, right? Uh, But for me, it's always been comfort music, that someone understands what what I'm going through, right? Or that, um, like, there's a a revolution song uh, called Courage to Grow that is on my top list that's going to be coming out with my first music episode. But in that song, they say... uh, so now you're 45 and you realize just what you want to do with your life just took some time for you to figure it out you know it it doesn't matter how old you are like sometimes these things these these manifestations of your life take time for you to actually achieve that point in your journey where you can reflect and understand like okay now i'm here and i can use this experience to to better myself to better the people around me especially when we have mediums like this like you were saying earlier about the positives of technology you know we have these mediums these these formats platforms that we can use to reach hundreds to thousands to millions of people right and and you know all of the stuff that i've been through i think a lot of it provides unique perspectives that a lot of different people go through, right? Uh, I grew up in poor neighborhoods. I've grown up in rich neighborhoods. I have uh, been a victim of abuse. I've also, you know, lived decently high on life, you know, just riding it, you know, riding life like a a standard millennial does, you know. Um, I've also, dealt with being a victim of racism you know I've dealt with uh my wife is English she's from England and we brought her here through immigration so I've dealt with immigration I'm a father I'm all these things you know I'm all these different labels and like you said in one of your videos you know you're not any of these one things don't define you all of these things define you right and 
uh, I've realized that at this point in my journey, that all of these things that I've been through in my journey could culminate to this moment where I can actually share these things with the world. You know, um, no, they're not all going to impact everybody, but they will, that certain instances of my life will impact certain people that are going through certain things, right? Um, so music in that way. And then um, what was the other thing I said? Oh, stand up comedy. Um, you know, a lot of stand up comedians are older guys. They're like guys in their 30s and 40s. And that's because you have to go through that life experience to have things to talk about. You know, and that's kind of what I'm realizing now that I'm 32 and I'm, I'm, I've got some of these experiences under my belt. Like I said, I'm becoming, a, I'm, I, I will still say I'm becoming a husband, right? We're going through constant growth. Um, I, you know, I wasn't raised by a proper father to be a good husband. So I'm learning how to be a husband. Um, you know, fortunately, my wife had a great example for a mother and she is a really great wife, but she was an only child. So she struggles with her motherhood. You know, we, we all have our own struggles. Um, but I, uh, you know, again, I just, all of these things have culminated into wanting to share my experience with the world. And I mean, I'm just, I'm glad for you too, to have come to that same point in your life where now you, you really want to put yourself out there. Um, so is there anything else that you wanted to say about your book or anything specific that you wanted to point to? Um, you know, any one particular message or, uh, uh, I suppose just going back on, on what you were just talking about there. And it's interesting that you say about, you know, using music or, uh, stand up comedy. And that's the premises of my book is how I use creativity to move from my head to my heart. Like listening to you there and talk about this song does this, you know, this music does this and brings you back to your story. Where does that take you from? It takes you from your head into your heart. And Absolutely. that's where your soul is. Like that music is speaking to your soul. Creativity moves us from our head into our, our heart, through our hands, through our voice, to doing. And that's right. where I, I know where how I've moved. I was up here with books and stories and intellect. Da, 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 da. It was only when I moved down into creating poetry, writing, speaking from my heart, talking my truth, like the way songs do, like the way, you know, playing the guitar or writing or, you know, it's a form of expression. You know, music or creativity, it, it, it allows us to do, allows us to process, you know, because a lot of our pain, we, we bring it into our into our ears, our mind, and it just gets lodged here. And we don't process it. We, we bury it with complexities and throw drink on top and drugs and that, 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 that. But creativity, like you'll hear many uh, musicians or many poets, many artists or many, you know, famous people, they'll express their pain through their, through their creativity, through their music, through their writing. And that's what I've done. You know, I started unbeknownst to myself by writing poetry, but I wrote my first poem in 2015. I, I didn't know what I was doing. And then I wrote more and I threw them around. And then, then through the podcast, you know, I was moving from my head to my heart unconsciously by interviewing people, talking right. about my pain, using the, the, the modus operandi of a podcast, of a, of a media thing, so I could process and speak my truth, talk about my pain. Although I was interviewing people, but subconsciously was, I was going somewhere that I, I didn't know where my heart was taking me. And that was, I was using this vehicle of creativity to, to express my pain. And then the book, you know, I talk about my, my backstory, but I talk about all my poems. I, you know, I talk about compassion, talk about uh, vulnerability. You know, I talk about, you know, uh, different aspects of, of parts of my life that I had difficulty with, you know, how impactful, you know, love and kindness was, meditation, mindfulness, awareness, all through creativity. And that's what the book is. It's a collection of that, you know, my poems, my tools and tips that I use for, for, for minding my little self, you know, all the while 
I recognised that there was a little kid of me that didn't feel minded. Like, I was well loved as a child. My parents loved me, my dad loved my family. But I just didn't feel loved because of that. So I was like an acorn. I was close, 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 close. Now I'm, I'm opening up. And the, the tools to help me do that was creativity, love, kindness, compassion, forgiveness, humour, uh, meditation, uh, many, many different things. And I've tried to put that in there. You know, I, I, I have a gratitude journal. I pray. I meditate. I use physical activity, you know, where before it would have been all body, 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 body. Now I'm mind, soul, and then my body lasts because I think we're, we're more than our body. We're more than our labels. You know, right. a great point that you made there. I don't, I don't label myself or anything. I don't say I'm a survivor. I don't say I was an addict. I don't say I'm a father. These are all just functions and experience that I go through in life. Uh, that I'm not attached to, that I don't say this is me. You can't define me by saying I'm this, 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 this. I'm I'm undefinable. We are undefinable. You know, I can't say I'm a bin man. I can't say I'm a plumber. I can't. How many labels could you possibly have? You like the the guy from what's uh, is it Game of Thrones? The man with a thousand faces. There are many faces. Right. You know, we, you know we're we're infinite. All we are is just loving awareness. We're just. As you said there, you try to stay present, which is brilliant. And procrastination is a, is a form of minding yourself as well. Uh, people say, if you give it a bad label, you know, if you procrastinate all the time and do nothing, then you're not going to get towards your goals. But Well, I've you know, been in that place. You know, yeah, I've course. definitely been in that. I, I lived in that space for a long time where, you know, a lot of things wouldn't get done just because I, like I was saying about, kind of the the transference of energy right you I, I would spend so much energy like putting these things off that I could just do and then it's done um it it, it really never made any sense and and the same is true for uh you know going through trauma when you you spend a lot of energy trying to bottle your trauma right rather than trying yeah, but... to accept your trauma now my wife and I have talked about this and I won't go into too much detail on her part but she was a victim of sexual abuse and she always struggles with it and you know nobody has the answers specifically for another person on how you know that it, it's all down to individual ways and means of, of dealing with your trauma but we we've discussed this before that you know you don't have to forgive your attacker you know, all these people sit like a lot of psychologists and and such will tell you you need to forgive the person i i personally don't believe that you need to forgive somebody their transgression but you do need to accept the fact that it happened and that you may never know why, or you most likely will never know why, right? And and if you, I think, when you accept those things, at least in, in part of my own traumas, um, it just allows me to still hold on to it, but not live in it, right? You're never going to forget it, and it doesn't have to be forgiven, but you can live with it you know, and you don't have to dwell on it. You can learn from it. Like mm -hmm. I know from my experience and what I went through, a lot of things that I don't want my kids to go through. Yeah, you know? yeah absolutely, absolutely. Let's take it away from sexual abuse and violence and trauma, because that's sometimes very hard for people to get their mind around, right? Bring it back to, let's say, the weather, or an argument with somebody, sometimes we resist what is. Our greatest difficulty is resisting. I don't want this to be like this. So right. we push, we pull, we don't want it. So accepting what is, like accepting the things for what they are. You know, we always want to change. I don't want this, push it away, pull it in. I don't want this. You know, so there is the greatest difficulty. As for forgiveness, you know, sometimes we can't even forgive ourselves. So it's very hard to try honestly and openly forgive somebody else. When we 
forgive ourselves when we give ourselves up and kindness it's a little easier to do it with, with other people but my greatest thing was accepting the situation for what it is you know i never wanted it to be like this i never wanted my life to be like why me why this why 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 you know right. it's like it's like playing tug of war with a rope push pull push i don't want this you know when we accept and that doesn't mean when we say accept it doesn't mean we stay here right we accept the situation that we're in but doesn't mean we can't grow doesn't mean we can't improve we can't like from an evolutionary psychology point of view we're here to adapt we're here to be to grow to to get stronger as a species blah blah blah, blah. so we as a human being we can accept this and we can grow from this situation only when we let go of our resistance to i don't want it i'm stuck i've here got in a the good pool. one i've got a good one for you so think about it in terms of money troubles a lot of people suffering from money troubles, especially right now in the pandemic with everything that's been shut down, people out of business and work and all this, you know, you could choose to live in that stress every day. Absolutely, because it's looming right over your head. All that weight is on your shoulders. But you really just have to accept that that's your situation and do what you can to fix it. But beyond that whatever it is that you do still have take stock on that and and really embrace what it is that you do have rather than fighting what it is you can't control right yeah a hundred percent you know as victor frankl would say you know if the situation is not going to change you have to then make changes you know, you have to change. And and how, how often, Aaron, do we look outside of ourselves for change when we hold the key to the kingdom, which is our ability to change? We right. can change this situation. Like you and I now are using our past as a stepping stone to bring us to our future. How often have people just been stuck in the mud? And you right. have said to yourself, you know, you've done nothing for years. You've procrastinated. I yep. believe you just weren't ready. I wasn't ready. But now I am ready. I, I, I heal part of myself that's okay to be seen. There's still lots of parts that I still have to unearth and look at. But I'm okay to do it now because I believe in the divine timing. I believe by looking back at Steve Jobs and say, I can join the dots, know that I have strength. I know that I have courage. I'm brave. I'm a, I'm a good work ethic. I'm a kind, loving person. I never knew right. it was all that. But it took me to this point to realize that. You know, but I did what you did. I did what many, many people, I was stuck in the mud. I blamed the world. I looked out at how, look at how bad and how awful the world is. When really I felt that about myself and it was only through turning in and looking at myself and forgiving myself for all the wrongdoings. If I had a new better, I would have done better, as Maya Angela would say. I didn't right. know. I was, I was immune. I was just minding myself by either procrastinating, by taking drugs, by being toxic towards the world. I was shouting at the world because I was shouting at myself. You right, know? right, it's when, absolutely. It's, 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 yeah, I truly believe that we can, when we start accepting ourselves, that we can accept other parts uh, of life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, accepting myself for me, I it's always seemed like, and this is before today's day and age where you go on Facebook and you see people using filters or this or that for whatever, and, you know, kind of constructing their perfect life and social media, right? Uh, even before all that, I felt like most of the people that I met had themselves figured out. They knew who they were. And I always struggled with that. <laughs> always and a lot of it again has to do with my past I mean I in 12 years of school I went to 12 different schools not all at the same time I stayed in a couple of places a little longer and left a couple of places early not due to discipline or anything like that but um in going through that I just always struggled with who I was, where do I fit in and that kind of thing. And I, I think 
especially with these politically charged times, it's helped me find kind of where I fit in is in the middle, <laughs> you know, as far as opinions or big opinions and things are concerned, I, I find that I sit in the middle and reflecting back on my life from that perspective, I've always kind of sat in this position of moderation where, and by moderation, I mean, moderating for the people around me, you know, kind of, in a sense, judging all of the things around me, I can, I can see through bullshit really easily. You know, I've, I've always been an observer of people. And, uh, because I've always been such a loner in a way and and really not through any personal desire I just I always desired acceptance but for whatever reason I just wasn't accepted right mm -hmm. and even now I can't put those pieces together but that's one of those things that you just have to accept and and move on from right those those high school kids that that bullied you or whatever the 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 many, many years of trauma that I dealt with from that. And even after the fact that I went through still trying to discover who I was, um, when in reality, I'm coming to realize that it's right there all along, right? Who you are is right there the whole time. Even if you think that you're trying to find yourself, right? You, you are who you are and you just have to accept that. You know, what, whatever those quirks about you are, whatever it is that about you that is out of place from the people around you. Um, let me tell you, too, with technology, like it's taught, taught me that a group that identifies with you is within a typing reach, <laughs> right? Yeah. So somewhere on the internet, there is a group that identifies with whatever your proclivity is, with whatever it, your inclination is, whether good, bad, heinous, yeah. you know, to uh, yeah, absolutely, sexual, what is, whatever. It, it's all there. As what is where uh, uh, Rumi would say, whatever you are looking for is looking for you. You know, whatever you you're looking for. And, you know, for me, like listen to you there and about like acceptance and party. Yeah, yeah. For me, it goes back to always my sense of feeling unloved. You know, I've always this sense of that I wasn't loved. I did, I'm not good enough to be loved and blah, blah, blah. And it was only when I started looking in the mirror or seeing my own reflection or understanding of my own qualities that I, I began to love myself or really connect with the things that I like and like what you were saying I was too bullied as well and look for acceptance but when we look for acceptance it means that we feel like we're not somebody that can be accepted but when we start to accept ourselves for all that like I wear odd socks and I wear odd socks I have crazy thoughts like where I believe that we're crazy thoughts people that think like this are crazy or people do this you know, men don't cry, so I thought I was weak, uh, you know, right. had, same, uh, same. Had a, but the society told me the way I was was not good enough, and that's the narrative, that was the rhetoric I have, but now I'm like, fuck that, no way, you know, I truly believe that everything I am is just who I am, I am unique, and that's perfect, that I am perfect for me, and you are perfect for you, and, you know, I don't believe that, you know, uh, that the story we were told is true anymore, where I did before. Right. You know, I don't need to be accepted by anybody. You know, I used to have great difficulty in the job and I give talks to consultants or higher management. Who am I? A guy that, that, that had failed all these like, who was he to stand here and give these people talks? Yaddy, yaddy, yaddy. That's all bullshit. When I realized that nobody has it sorted, like I've been on many, many courses and holotropics and with all these counselors and psychodynamic specialists, blah, blah, blah. And everybody's doing the work. We just presume and assume that, that people have a sorted. It's just a giant fucking uh, guesstimation. You yeah. know, we're all, we're all just trying to find a way. But if we can do that with a little bit more compassion, as Rumi says, we're all just walking each other home. You know, right. you know, you might be a little further down the road with technology. I might be a little further down the road with, with spirituality or a little bit further down the road with training, blah, blah, blah. But if we just average all together, we're all just 
finding our way and why not just be kind you know i might be better something you might be better something but when we even it out we're just the same right you, know, you might be good at guitar i might be good at Forgive dancing me for just a minute i, I need to run yeah. to the restroom i'll be real quick no problem All right, great. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, um, definitely. I mean, acceptance is something that many, 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 many people struggle with acceptance and anxiety, depression, you know. Um, but I've come to realize too about myself that for what depression is, I don't know if you have it, if you've personally dealt with it if maybe now you feel like in some way you've overcome it or maybe do you still have days that hold you down um but i definitely have days that i just i can't get it together like I, from the minute i wake up it just feels like the whole day is off you know even even in my my mindset like i really do uh stay in this kind of stress-free positive lane like 95 percent of days but there's that five percent where i just can't get it together for the day and uh, okay so that see that point there that you just made there that is a perfect example for somebody to practice acceptance because for for forever and a day i have those moments which i wasn't aware of that i'd have them days that five percent or whatever i did not accept that because society told me no, that's not right. You should not feel like that. You shouldn't feel weak. You shouldn't feel vulnerable. So I had this whole problem around accepting those moments. And it was only when I realized that this will pass, this too will pass. Storms don't last forever. I know it's probably a bit cliche, blah, blah, blah. When you realize and you accept, I'm actually feeling a bit fucking shit today or feel very vulnerable, I feel very weak, very nervous, very anxious. But I know this won't last. And right. This will go tomorrow or the next day. And then you go, exactly. wow. It's them moments of acceptance where you can then bring them into others because this is all about our transferable skills. Like yeah. when you develop acceptance in a moment, like getting anxious in Tesco's or a shopping center, or getting angry, instead of resisting the anger, resisting the, oh, wow. Because I watch myself go, look at you, you're going crazy because this woman put the money on the counter, she didn't hand it to you. And you go, ah, I accept this, this is okay. We're, right. we're not the player in the game. We're not just rah, 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 fuck this and blah. When you watch and then become accepting of a moment, then you go, ah, and then you can move into a bigger situation, a bigger situation. Because it starts all very small, like what you just said there. I woke up today and I just all over the shop. I explain it like a snow globe. Some right. days I wake up and I'm like a snow globe. I can't yep. see the world. I can't see it. reality. That's me. So and your brain just that. can't get it together. Yeah. And then you go, it's just one of those days. Just one of those days. Practice. Yeah. You practice minding your little self because you can yeah. go to one of those days and you blame the world, you're flipping tables and you're roaring at your kids. And when really I, I did want to speak to that, your, your phrase, minding your little self, the way that I heard that, I hear it in that way that it sounds sort of condescending, but I also hear minding that little voice in yourself. You know, that's that's I think the key of what you want to take from it. When you when you hear that phrase, as somebody who might hear that phrase from you, you know, mm -hmm. you you want to to be conscious of that little voice, and you know, but don't don't live in your victimhood. You know, don't don't dwell on your depression if you can avoid it in that day. You know, don't don't trigger your own anxieties by being anxious about certain things that may or may not happen or <clears throat> things that are out of your control you know mm -hmm. it and 
I think, of course, there are people out here that still struggle with that for various reasons. But, uh, you know, I think it's important for those of us that kind of do get it or do have these mechanisms for getting through these tough times to share those things with people that that may struggle themselves, you know, yeah. especially for those who can identify with the that loner mentality that, you know, you constantly feel like you're alone. Like you said, you contemplated suicide. I've done the same. You know, my mm -hmm. wife's done the same. Uh, for those of us that, like I said, struggle for acceptance, I mean, it's, I think, pretty common, especially this day and age with technology the way it is and people getting bullied on a scale that we can't even understand. You know, yeah. it's, uh, it's definitely understandable why people contemplate suicide, but I think that for anyone who does contemplate suicide, if you have even one person in your life that cares about you and you know that they care about you, whether you feel like you can reach out to them or not about this issue, you know, you have to consider who you're going to affect and, and how it might affect them. It's not just about you, right? You're, your how you feel about yourself is important but the impact you have on the world is equally important right um your moral obligation if you will to to those around you you know you you want to set a good example right and you definitely don't want to be the, the example that maybe convinces your little niece to in future kill herself or your your yeah. mother to kill herself because now she can't cope with her life or you know you you really have to consider the impacts that you're going to have on the people around you if you're if you're contemplating suicide i think yeah um it's it, I've, I've i've done training in suicide you know uh, asking people putting morality on them like morality uh, you're a bad person if you eat a steak or you're a bad person if you eat a bar of chocolate but, you know i don't know if i can bring morality into it and you know yes we are always trying to have a positive influence and a positive impact and look after a family and but you know when somebody is going through suicide you know to put that responsibility on, oh, you know, you don't do it because your kids, because you think the chances are that's never stopped anyone doing that before. That puts more guilt and shame on people, you know. Right. Um, you know, I've had it and I never thought about my family or friends. I just wanted the pain to stop. I couldn't see beyond the darkness. I couldn't see beyond the pain. You know, right. I wanted this pain. It's the brain really in a weird way trying to protect itself it wants to protect it from further pain so it says you know what let's cut the legs off this and kill it and by taking your life by suicide you know so to ask somebody to not to do because of this because of their family because of their friends you know it's probably it's probably very difficult to do you know of course we want to do it of course in when we come out the other side we feel terrible shame we feel terrible guilt that oh i could have took my own life and i'm gonna leave all these people and yada right. yada, yada you know it's it's very it's very complex you know it's it, it, suicide and so what would you health. suggest for someone who's reached that point where you know they don't feel like they have anything to live for that you know maybe they've lost everything that they did have to live for again it's again they've lost everything that they it's again it's perception did they really it's how are they seeing the world you know they may right. see like perception is reality but it's not fact you know and as we just talked about aaron we may wake up and see like the world is shit and everything but what if i was to sit down with you and we went through those fears, through those worries, through those perceptions of the world is shit and everything's changed. You know, it's horrible. It's bad. Perception is reality, but it's not fact. You know, if, if somebody came to me and they were struggling with suicide and, you know, blah, blah, everything would be was to, would be to try keep them safe, to try. But they have to want to do it for themselves. You know, right. you have you have to want to stay alive. You have to want to stay here. You, you know, and it's about then shining a light on you know, their life and, and the possible things that's going well from that they just not might be, they might not be seeing, you right. know, they might not be seeing the, the things around them. Like when we, when we're going through like a mental health problem or suicide, how, how narrow is our vision, Aaron? You know this, 
we can only see the world through this tiny prism. Right. When we're feeling vibrant and happy and excited, our peripheral vision is we, we nearly like have 20 20 vision, like when you're feeling on your Gucci best and you're brilliant. The world looks totally different, colors are more vibrant, life is a little bit more abundant and prosperous. When we're going through suicide, mental health, trauma, we see it through a tiny, tiny lens. When we're, we're, we're working with people or helping people, can we just widen that from? Can we bring into vision what may be going? And that's true gratitude, mindfulness, meditate, whatever. But just shining a light on maybe something else that's going on for them in their life. You know, they may right. they may have qualities and strengths that they're just not seeing. You know, uh, and to go back on your your comment about or your point about them minding our little self, yeah, like you and I will know what this is like to uh, to have a childhood trauma, to feel lesser. You know, if your boss comes in and judges you or says your work is shit or somebody does something to you, you just feel that little bit less. And that's that inner child in you that wasn't loved, wasn't minded, wasn't protected. You go back to that. You know, like when somebody pulls out in a car or, or goes to hit you. Right. The first, of all, the first reaction is fear. I mean, yeah. we masqueraded as angry, as anger. Oh, fucking rah, 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 rah. But right. the first instinct was fear. Yeah. You feel less. You feel child like, you know. Yeah. You you mentioned that earlier, uh, uh, something about fear that made me think, too. I, I had this thought a while back, but I I felt it was sort of an epiphany that, you know, we all come with kind of primal fears, right? Like fear of spiders or fear of heights um, falling. It's part of our falling, nervous I think system. Is, what they say like the greatest fear for a baby is um so uh, but i think at least once you reach a point of cognizance um i think all of our greatest fear if you boil it down is the fear of the unknown right in one way or another whether you know whether you don't know if you're going to get a raise or you don't know what happens after you die, like the, all of these are, are fears that kind of all boil down into the fear of the unknown, right? Uncertainty. Uncertainty, right. And and it just, uh, there, there are, it made me think about there are hyper adventurous people that, that kind of put on this this mask of no fear, right? Like they'll dive out of planes or, you know, they'll squirrel suit, fly around the side of mountains and things like that. And as awesome as it is, I mean, those people still have fears too, right? They just don't wear it on their sleeve. Um, yeah. They just pack the moment and, you know, what what's going to come comes. But I think that they still struggle with the same fear of the unknown, just in different regards of their life, right? Maybe they, they're not worried about jumping off the side of the mountain, but they are worried about whether or not they're going to get some endorsement or whether or not, uh, you know, the book that they're writing is going to go off very well. <laughs> you know, there's, yeah. there's plenty like of unknowns you... to be scared of, um, but yeah, you can't let the fear of the unknown stop you from trying yeah right look, and I, I, look, I've, I experienced that a lot um and, and that's kind of what I was getting at earlier with having gone through a hundred jobs or whatever that in in doing all of the menial different things that I've done I've done some some kind of exciting different you know jobs as well that I was hoping you know hey this might be my thing but it just turned out not to be or whatever. I I always knew going through those things that I was destined for something, right? Um, not to say like greatness or to be exalted in any way, just something that I could actually achieve and, and something that I could help people with their struggles. You know, I thought, in school, I thought about being a psychologist or being a teacher, an American history teacher was kind of one of my my big thoughts for a while. And um, 
I also thought about being a guardian ad litem, which is like a court appointed um, guardian for a child in a situation of like a custody battle. They decide what, you know, where's the best place for a child to go. Um, there, there have been a lot of positions that I've considered doing to use my experience or to use myself to give back to people. And, you know, after all this time, all this contemplating, I mean, I, I sat recently, I've been just figuring out like, how am I going to do something positive and meaningful and passionate for me and stop fearing the unknown and start really gathering my here and now thoughts and turning them into something that's relevant and tangible and and fulfilling and uh that is what's driven me into this i mean i i i over and this has been just over the last couple of years i sat down to write a novel i wanted to write an epic fantasy novel i love harry potter i love lord of the rings i love a lot of like dragon lance Dungeons and Dragons type stuff. Um, I so I thought, you know, I'm gonna sit and write an epic novel. And I sat and I started character uh, evolution and, and uh, creating s plots and things like this. And and I was like, you know, I just don't have time to be a writer. Like when I work a full time job and I get home at night, the last thing I want to do is sit here and write all night long we've fallen asleep and stuff it's got to be something that that piques my interest in the right way that keeps me flowing that keeps me passionate that can keep me up at two in the morning to talk to a guy in ireland <laughs> you know a guy that i don't even know we're just going to take a chance we're going to go on the fly and you know that that's i i, I sat and i wrote rap for a while because i thought you know maybe that's going to be my calling like i never wanted to be I never wanted to be famous. You know, I don't want to be a celebrity. Um, but the more time has gone on, I've realized that I do just want to be heard. Uh, I don't really care about a status or a label, if you will. Um, but I do, I've been listening to a lot of our our political rhetoric these days and like i was saying about being a moderator for society i hear the positive here i hear the positive here and i but i see nothing but just constant competition and, and combativeness you know there's no leeway it, it's all political posturing in this it's there's no leeway for that middle ground and that's where I've found my voice to be that that position of of a moderator to society, you know. Um, and so again, you know, all of these things have just accumulated into into me pursuing this passion over anything else. This gives me an opportunity to express my creativity to to vote blocks of time to talking about my interests and, and hopefully getting other people interested, but feeding conversation that keeps people interested and locked in and wanting to add to that conversation. Like people that the, the greatest reward that I feel we can have as podcasters is for our audience members to wish that they could be here sitting in this conversation with us interjecting and, and having their opinion heard too. You know, when I, when I sit and I listen to podcasts or I watch podcasts, I watch a lot, a lot of Joe Rogan, um, out of his 1600 nearly episodes or, or slightly more, I've watched probably 1200 of them, like lots and lots of Joe Rogan. So a lot of this is inspired by that. Um, but I, I, that's what I, I want. I want people to feel like they're a part of my community, this community of people don't like us, like for whatever reason, people don't like us, whether it's the color of our hair or you're too short or you dress a weird way or you like a weird thing or what, whatever it is, you know, we all have that thing that people don't like us about. And this whole podcast, this whole, this whole platform that I'm building is about 
creating a union of understanding that we are we all have something in common right mm -hmm. and and we all really need to focus on that and then those things that we do not have in common that we have biases about generally speaking unless it's a point of conflict we need to leave it alone and if it is a point of conflict then we need to figure out how to actually resolve that conflict not just try to brush it under the rug and hope that you know bury it like you were saying about traumas you can't just bury a thousand year conflict between israel and palestine right you have to sit and talk about it. You have to bring it to the present moment and stop thinking about what happened a thousand years ago and think we are here today. How can we solve this problem for our people today so that people stop dying? That's what's more important, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so or or whatever the issue is, you know, to, I, I think one thing that you touched on earlier that's huge for me that I want to bring about at some point is education. Um, the way that our education is constructed, and I think this goes across a lot of what people would consider westernized nations or like first world nations, is that you, all of your education is, is built around making you a cog in the machine. It's just enough to get by in an everyday general life. It's not enough to teach you how to be a critical thinker, how to balance finances, how to become a successful person, how to delve into the world and find what it is you're passionate about, what makes you you, what makes you unique. How can you apply your unique perspective to said thing and blossom that into you know what you're saying just use your creativity from your mind to your heart and turn that into something that is meaningful not just to you but to others as well so that we can all continue to inspire each other right by focusing on that which is common about all of us mm. sorry i know that was a giant mouthful <laughs> Um, but that, you know, these are things that both of us are clearly passionate about. And that's, that's what all of this is about um, for both of us. You know, you have your angle with your podcast and your book. And uh, a lot of it is very similar for me from my podcast. I mean, my podcast has a lot of different angles that I intend to approach with it. Uh, not just political, but this angle of finding people who are pursuing their passions and turning them into something successful um that's inspiring to me you know like uh like i was saying about revolution for instance you know underground bands or artists that are like rap artists i listen to a lot of underground rap and reggae and they all identify with us in the way that they you know they had to grow organically right because whatever they were doing was not of the mainstream and it wasn't going to get them in the door with Warner Brothers or who, you know, whoever they needed to do, Sony or whoever they needed to get in the door with. Um, they had to forge their own paths and they had to be passionate enough about it to continue it even in the darkest of times. You know, I for us, we have to even if our, we put out a podcast this week that gets 10 views, we need to still put out a podcast next week. You know, we, when you find what it is that you're passionate about, you've got to put everything you have into it or you're not going to get back from it what it is that you're, you know, that you're trying to achieve. Um, so uh, when does your book come out? When is it officially released? it will be out monday or tuesday it's gone to the printer and uh, we're just waiting to come back and then i'm doing a talk with a company that are sponsoring me with it called junior genius they're a crash in clondalkin near where i live and um, so it's kind of ironic that i come from a childhood trauma now and come back they're sponsoring me with the book they're, they're giving it to their staff as gifts for christmas they're going to go and speak to them 
uh, a few other staff are on some of the courses I teach. I, I've got mind your little self, uh, six week course, and then I've another one called Clarity and Success. That's another uh, a four week course. It's an add on from the last one that I built. Right. So it's out on Tuesday. Uh, that's their collaboration. Then I'll have my own one as well without their sponsorship on it. So Tuesday, hopefully, uh, I've got like I'm, I have this Christmas gift set I'm doing as well. It's called Mind Your Little Self Gift Set. There's a hat, there's a, a book, there's incense, there's candles, there's food, there's drink, just a little gift so people know how to mind their little selves. Right. Okay. So this this is good. This I want to bleed this into a segue. Um, a while back my wife and I, we started to do yoga. And it's because we just feel sick of our current selves and we need to get into shape. And, you know, yoga is a good way to kind of slowly open yourself back up into exercising because you can stretch at your level, right? Um, we didn't realize that a big part of yoga is affirmation and meditation. And just in the short time that we were doing it i was able to realize like how powerful it actually can be if you truly sit there and thoughtfully consciously meditate on what your expectations are for the day you know what your goals are for yourself either for the day or for your life like a a general message or feeling about yourself like you know you you know you sit there and you say these things to yourself but you say them in a way that you really mean them right you have to be in that wholesome place and you have to be in that of that mind that like you're speaking truth to your reality right you're, you're you know you're speaking from your mind to your heart into being right that's that's your hope right so but it, it really can have an impact on you through each day. Like I remember one of the days we had this affirmation. Um, I don't remember exactly what the affirmation was, but later in the day, uh, my wife was in a stressful moment and she found it in herself to actually recite her affirmation out loud because it crossed her mind, right? Because that's, that's the whole purpose of it. And in that moment, she went from stressed out to boom, I'm good. Like that affirmation recalled, I'm not going to stress out today or whatever it was. Um, it, it was something to that effect. Like, I'm not going to let things get to me today or something, something like that. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, it keyed me into how, much of a difference it really can make when you meditate yeah. what brought yeah, well, you to meditation well just my whole spiritual practice look i i have my background in sports science and health i don't personal training for that you know basically just go back to what you just said about your wife there she basically changed what i talked there about changing our biochemistry she was going through a stress on all my cortisol that's you know a, a response to stress you know fight flight but then she started eliciting by, by giving herself affirmations, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin. She was changing her own biochemistry to the toss. Our brain believes whatever we tell it. So look, you've been telling yourself you're useless and shit all your life and you believe that. Why not give yourself affirmations that, that serve you well and bring you towards your goal? We are goal-seeking right. organisms. We're always looking for goals, goals, goals. Why not dictate your goals? Why not set them for yourself? instead of letting society and the world uh, choose to fight. And that keeps us connected to a, to a process, keeps us connected to ourselves. Uh, where did I bring it in? Again, I was always body, always interested in training, training, training. But then when I realized there's more going on, mind is the CEO, soul is our heart, and then our body. Our body is the last piece for me now, it's form. Uh, and then just by interviewing people and reading all these spiritual people, you know, are, have a great success all the game changers that i've interviewed in the podcast all the people i work with they might be onto something here this meditation this mindfulness this it's not all just about doing burpees and bench presses hold on a minute so we just start slowly bringing in like gratitude you know and there's more than it we're more than a physical body we're a spirit you know we're we're a spirit in a body rather than a body in a spirit and that's where i just brought it in 
and it yeah, really absolutely. because everything I wanted when I started counseling and mindful, you know, I wanted to be calm, I wanted to be centered, I wanted to be at peace, and that's what, by what, combining it. What was the very first thing though that introduced you to meditation? Do you remember like the day that you figured out, like, wow, this can actually work? Uh, oh yeah like i had a profound moment when i listened to jack cornfield uh love and kindness meditation jack cornfield i absolutely adore uh, and i was like i was going through a, a, a really difficult moment i remember lying in bed crying and really sad and again you're searching like as Rumi says you search for what's looking for you i was searching for peace i was looking for calm and i was looking for meditation but i heard all oh, meditation's great for you blah blah and i found this love and kindness and in this moment, I ask you to think of somebody you, you, you love and visualize them. And I felt this overwhelming sense of connection to my daughters, this love, this passion. I was like, wow, how can I go from that place from there to here? And that was a game changer. But it took me a long That was in 2015. Right. But then it just slowly, slowly, slowly. You know, I, I pick it up, I drop it down. You're like, yesterday I struggled to meditate, but I just did it anyway. No, I lie, I didn't do it yesterday. I struggled the day before. Uh, I still have to do it. When we finish this, I will I will go and meditate. It takes practice. Right. But I really, that hook got me. Again, feelings, emotions, hook it. And that <laughs> feeling of love, oxytocin, just beautifulness. I was able right. to switch from a moment of crying, sadness, grief, stress, to into this lovely moment. And that really got me. Right. Absolutely. Give me just a second to grab this piece of paper and then uh, we'll go ahead and start kind of working towards the conclusion. Um, yeah, I mean, that's great though. Like once you work, uh, meditation into your life, you really can affect positive change, like to yourself that you really can't understand until you meditate, right. Until you actually try affirmation and then you then you realize the power of it, right? I, it was a shock to me, you know, I guess maybe it's a bravado thing or whatever that when most guys hear yoga, they're just like, oh, yoga, <laughs> whatever, you know, that you just kind of blow it off like, no, oh, that's not for me. But actually giving it a chance and realizing that about it just blew my mind, right? That, that it really can changing your mindset to positive thinking from negative thinking as we were talking about you know stress transference or whatever the, that that balance of energy to yourself rather than fighting things try to accept them and that kind of thing you know it all it all ties into the circle of your mind <laughs> that you know you just but you can if you if you do make that transition you can positively affect your own outcomes hmm. you know and and when you constantly tell yourself i can't do it or you know you listen to other people's interjections it can't be done you know you're wasting your time things like that that you can't feed into that stuff you, you have to to really push yourself positively you know, and, and like I was saying earlier, despite whether or not we get a couple of views this week or, you know, hundreds of views, like you, you still have to maintain positivity, no matter what people have to say, you know, we sit here, we pour our hearts out and there are going to be people, people out there that just want to tear us down, that just want to troll the podcast. You know, we, you can't let those things affect you. You can't let the bullies at school affect you in that way. You know, that I, 
especially when it comes to bullies, I think a lot of people don't understand that, that they're going through something too, right? Of course. They're, they're bullying you for a purpose to get some kind of pleasure for themselves because they can't get pleasure elsewhere. Mm. Um, you, you just have to overcome that fear, you know, you and and do it through positive thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so before we conclude about the book, where can you buy it once it's well, you can, you can just send me an email and I'll, 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 I'll post it out. Uh, we don't, we're, we're working on getting it onto our site, trying to get spot, uh, Shopify or, you know, I, I, I sell publish, so it's not in, uh, uh, it's not on shelves yet. Right. But when I, when I gain traction and because I know money to fund this, a friend of mine, he was my editor or the, the graphic designer and he produced it and I got somebody else to do the editing. So it was all done really cheaply. Uh, but when we get traction and we get sales, but if people want to buy it, just send me an email at matt at magicminds.ie or check me out on social media at Magic Minds Podcast. And I matt can just post Magic Minds. What? Oh, yeah. Matt at Magic Minds.ie. It's my website. Matt at Magic Minds. Dot I e. I e. Interest E for elephant. Okay, great. <laughs> I'll send Matt you the link. I'll send, I'll send you the link. No, that's perfect. I just want to make sure that it's it's spelled out for anybody that wants to go check it out. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So once you get it, or that's your email. That that's email. email. If you want to buy it, they can transfer me or bank transfer me money or Revolut or whatever. We'll get it to them. And uh, I'll post it out to them, no problem. Uh, okay. But other than that, I'm selling it out of the back of the car. I'm just going <laughs> to sell, sell, sell. I'll send you and let you have a look and see what you think. It's That's all my great. poetry. It's all my work. And then it has a 52-week gratitude journal in it. So people record, they get reflections. And then every other page is my poems or just love and kindness, awareness, exercise or meditations, moments to practice mindfulness. It's, it's, a, it's a mental health toolkit, I believe. Very great. Very great. Um... And the price of it was 15 euros, right? Yep. Okay. So anybody interested, 15 euro and we'll work out how shipping and handling, right? Yeah, uh, we'll work that we'll out. You know but you just email my man Mike here about his book. Um, before we go, I did want to ask you just off topic of the book and all of the psychology type stuff that we've discussed. Um, what are things like in Ireland today? Uh, how's the economy? How's uh, just just a general overview? I mean, for, yeah, for, no. for, for the reason that I'm asking is because you're from Ireland and generally American audiences don't understand what it's like to live abroad, what, it, what, what the case is around the world. So, you know, just what, how's it going in Ireland? You know, that's, it's we're going through a difficult period you know like the rest of the world you know with the pandemic you know Ireland are in a huge debt at the moment due to the medical uh, situation the unemployment people can't work because of the 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 pandemic and the COVID situation you know we're just after coming out of a level five lockdown we're going into level I think it's three now you know bars haven't been open only wet wet bars are not open, just bars to sell food now can open, seem to open the other day. I'm not that uh, up on that kind of side of things, but I mean, the general, it's it's really difficult for people, like it is around the world, you know, I work in healthcare, work in a hospital, brain injury, rehab, and you know, it's staff are finding it difficult, you know, it, the, 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 the net is getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, you know, I think the whole world are experiencing, you know, uh, isolation, mental health, physical problems you know all these mental problems will manifest in physical problems and yeah absolutely just, yeah just the economy is really struggling there's a lot of unemployment i think we're in the debt of 240 billion at the moment wow. already and like there's going to be a, a tsunami of mental health coming down the road uh, i yeah, think it's, something that a lot of americans may not understand too and this it seems simple but so many of us aren't well versed in our geography and our governmental and cultural understandings. So just to explain, not all of Ireland is part of Great Britain. And or not, we're saying no, no, no. You live in the portion of Ireland that is solely 
Ireland as a country on its own. Um, and that's just something I wanted to point out that, uh, so do you guys have socialized medicine too? Socialized uh, healthcare? Yeah. What do you mean? So is your healthcare free, but it's paid into by all the citizens or is it all private? No, 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 no. no it's, it's, is it it's, tied it's, to your jobs like it is in America? I'm not okay with the, the system. In Ireland, you, you, you got to pay for your doctor. You got to pay for the hospital unless you have health care. You know, unless you're unemployed, then you get what known as a medical card. But you have to you have to pay. It's, it sounds like you know, it's pretty similar to here then. Like if you, your job it's, usually takes care of giving you health care. No, no, we don't. You got to pay for your own. Oh, okay. So it's all private then. Yeah, or unless you're unemployed that you get what's known as... Uh, a medical cards and then that's that's so it's private and it's public and if you're working you got to pay your own if you're not then you're on the the, the so what's the other. like affordability of your health care like it's quite expensive yeah yeah it, it's it's quite expensive especially you know? as a family do you pay like a family premium the, yeah there's all of these different packages i as again i'm not that au fait with it you know I, i'm a single man but I do have kids, but yeah, I don't know. That's not healthcare and politics is probably wouldn't be my strongest point. <laughs> right. Well, I was just, I was, I was just curious. You mentioned it. And, uh, you know, I, again, I'm just pointing out some differences or, or things that I don't even know about your country, you know, just, um, trying to gain an understanding of what Ireland's like compared to America. Cause I don't know. And, uh, so what kind of preventative measures are being taken in Ireland right now? As in from the COVID, COVID situation? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, you know, the, the main one, wash your hands, keep your social distance, two meters, everybody wear masks, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, restricted, restricted family gatherings, restricted gatherings, no open air concerts or, um, yeah. How are shop. they enforcing that? Uh, I just, I just think people are just doing it themselves. People are being pretty compliant, I think. Yeah. Uh, well, is there not sense. a lot of argumentative resistance to it like there is here? I'm not seeing it as much. I think people are a little bit more compliant. They're not really raging against the machine as much. No, I, I don't think people are trying their best, you know, uh, you know, especially in the hospital where I work, people are very compliant. And when I look around, you know, some people do, some people don't. There's not, there's not a big, uh, right. there's not a, uh, there's not a big uh, rage against it for sure. I mean, it it is a smaller country too. So in terms of the states and how we are and how the size we are, you know, most states individually are bigger than all of Ireland as a whole. So you know, it is it is a lot to balance, I guess, in our case for you know people that live so remotely they want to argue about it they don't want to comply but then it starts with one case and slowly grows into multiple multiples so um but it's good to hear that as a whole in ireland it seems like majoritively people are compliant you know i, I wish that's just the way it was uh here as well if if we just we're more mindful and thoughtful about you know well maybe you're not concerned about yourself but how about your own grandmother how about your own sister or you know i mean i i go as far as to worry about my co-workers and their families you know what i mean i i don't want to be responsible or feel responsible for making them sick or making one of their family members sick and potentially die you know i those are the things that I think about when I'm like, you know, I'm going to wear a mask, I'm going to wash my hands, I'm going to use alcohol, and I'm going to, you know, all the these preventative measures that I take, um, we, we, we're pretty strict in our house. Fortunately, we got a little ahead of the actual public announcement. My wife was tracking the actual story from China, so she was like, dude, this is serious, and I was like, oh, whatever. We've had the flu. I said all the same stuff that you hear people like still arguing now, despite scientific evidence. But before scientific evidence, I was like, man, we've had the flu, you know, that 
it comes back year after year. We've had plenty of viruses, not going to be any different. Sure, it's going to kill some people. So does the flu, you know, all of that, that stuff. But it wasn't until I guess I started to research it and I started to understand about how infectious it is versus something like the flu and other things. That's what separates this from, from those other things. Uh, not just the fact that it's a virus and, and a coronavirus, if you will, you know, the King virus. Um, <laughs> so it, it, uh, it, did you, for yourself, did you have to really change your personal lifestyle? Oh yeah, in, in big ways. Yeah, you know. Well, I mean, you said you work in the the medical field, right? And so yeah, or, or, or work in a hospital, so you have to change your practice. The whole how we deliver our, our service totally changed. Life has changed, but I'm very changeable. I'm adaptable. I might not want it, but I'm good with change. I've you know I've learned over the years. <clears throat> to have to adapt to situation. So although my past was difficult, it has taught me skills how to adapt. You know, I'm okay with I might not want to like many humans. Not the only person that wants change is a wet baby. Uh, right. But you just have to change, you know, and just get on. I've got a I've got a resilient mentality. I'm always uh, believe that you know we, we will get through things if you have a certain mindset so yeah it's been really difficult really difficult for people you know difficult worry difficult you know but yeah you just kind of have to get on right now i'm not being flippant in people's lives and say, tell them to get on it that's just my mentality i just said change if this is what i have to do if to wash my hands to wear a mask if to do this if to do that i'll do what i have to do to get the job done and uh, right. to so people are not going to get hurt and you know and to protect yourself and to protect yeah, the people I, that you help I, right I, I, I was never worried about that in the sense of me getting the coronavirus I, I, i'm a healthy human being i've got good uh, immune system you know I, I will be okay i will be grand i'm not right. worried about that but i'll make sure my family are safe and other people's family i won't put anybody in danger i won't be risky and i'll be okay yeah um did you guys get shut down at all initially yeah, yeah, no, the place was shut down on level five, you know, total lockdown, not total, but only shops and certain things were open, and yeah, it was, it was quiet, but that, look, I, I'm okay with those things, I don't really drink, I haven't drank in a long, long time, and right. so I wasn't too worried about it, just the family stuff and not seeing people, just more worried about other people, you know, not well, seeing I meant, I meant more specifically you guys, as in you at the hospital and your, your we kind continue. of branch. No, we continued. We never closed. Yeah. Like I changed. Ours was face-to-face -face contact all the time, but then that stopped. So we had to go online. We had to be creative, innovative. You know, I had to deliver. Okay. Sessions. That's Social what media. I was getting at. Did they shut down your kind of face-to-face -face no. stuff? No. Yeah, they did that, but we had to deliver. I've been brain injury rehab, so people still need service. They need, still need to be rehabilitated, you know. What so, can you do from a, like a remote location involving brain injury rehab you just have to be creative innovative you have to adapt to the environment you have to use whatever you can use you know uh, so well, i guess media. you have tools that you that you kind of usher your patients into and so you just kind of when you're having a remote conversation you just brush up on those tools and see how they're doing on a daily basis with those tools and that kind of thing yeah yeah all that kind of you just use the environment you just you have to be creative you have to just adapt you know and just whatever their deficit is create a, a plan that will help them get around based on their own goals you know right and it's all very individual right based on whatever course, kind of course, trauma course. they've suffered right yeah absolutely well that that in and of itself sounds like a fascinating entire hour-long other conversation <laughs> Um, nearly, nearly two hours of this matt it has been awesome having you here just like i thought it would be uh thank you so much for for joining me here and you know i i look forward to supporting each other moving toward the future you know i i definitely look forward to getting your book and reading that and That's maybe having much, you man. back on to kind of like have notated certain things and and you know bring them up and see kind of what inspired that comment from you or whatever you know just just I'll, I'll read it i'll come up with some ideas for sure and uh 
hopefully together we can encourage some others to want to read it too. <laughs> Absolutely. Aaron, thanks very much. I really appreciate this opportunity. I wish you well. I send love and kindness to America. I send love and kindness to you and your family. Uh, yeah, that, that's all we can do, isn't it? Just try to be kind and be the light in the dark for people. Absolutely, man. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, for all people who have watched up to this point, please like, subscribe. Most importantly, share, share, share as much as you can and you're willing to. We appreciate it. Um, you know, we we stayed up this late or got up this early to, to make this happen so that we we could hopefully provide some value to everybody else out there. And, uh, you know, just thank you from the bottom of our hearts for for being here to view us, support us. And uh, we we will grow together. Thanks. Thanks. Man. Aaron. Thanks Have a great thank day. Thank you, everybody. All right, I just stopped the recording. Dude, that was great. No cool, no worries, dude. I'm glad you liked it. You're gone. What about you? I hope you enjoyed it. I hope that my one in the morning ranting didn't uh, overpower you <laughs> yeah, too much. You're, you're gone off screen. Is that true? Oh, I'm. You just see.